Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Give us understanding. Lead us in the path of your commandments. Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. We long for your guidance. My friends, as we share Christ's precious peace one with another in the season of um, virus and epidemic, let us do it with the peace sign or a fish bump or an elbow bump. The peace of Christ be with you. Now give it away safely. If you're a visitor here today and you are wondering who we are and why we are gathered, then hear this. We are a people who know a God more mercy than judgment, more invitation than obligation, more do than don't, may than should, more beneficence than impatience. Somebody say amen. We know a God who plants gardens, forgives sinners, heals the broken, wraps up love in the flesh of an infant. Somebody say amen. We know a God whose largesse is our deliverance. So welcome to Old South Church in Boston. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here because this is God's house. Somebody say amen. amen. I have a few announcements. The first is an invitation. If you would consider our invitation to sign the friendship pad, there's a black pad at the aisle end of every pew. And if you're sitting on it, pass it to the person next to you. The more you write, the more we'll be able to respond to you. If you're just from away, just tell us what brought you here today. The white insert contains a lot of announcements about what is happening in the life of our church. Uh, we invite you to take a look in there to see ways to become engaged. Um, following worship, there's food and fellowship in the Gordon Chapel that way. There's a young adult drop-in group. Um, Note all the opportunities for Black History Month. Please also note, and I need to say it from the pulpit, that the uh, 350th annual meeting of Old South Church in Boston is called for Sunday, March 1st at 1230. Good friends, this is God's house, and God is home. So unplug, put your devices away, and let us offer to our God a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving.
invite David and Heidi to come forward with Eirik and bringing with them also Eirik's godparents, Scott and Margaret. With them also is Jonathan Alshire representing the deacons of Old South Church in Boston. Baptism is an outward form of an inward and spiritual reality. Through the sacrament of baptism, we affirm that Eirik is a gift from God. We give thanksgiving for him, and we welcome him into the company of the church. I invite you to find the uh, litany of baptism in your bulletins and join with me if you would. We are gathered to present Eirik Howard Keywell to the church and to dedicate him to God. What can we affirm about him? As Eirik grows and matures, how will he learn of the Christian story? In turn, what will we expect of Eirik? David and Heidi, parents, assume your primary responsibility for fulfilling these expectations by growing with Eirik in the Christian faith, helping him to become a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, and by offering him the nurture and support of the Christian Church. And do you, Scott and Margaret, godparents, agree to guide Eirik into becoming an engaged and complete human being, teaching him about personal sacrifice for a greater good, about grace and reconciliation, at times of human weakness, and the power of unconditional love for all people. In Old South Church, do you pledge to maintain a nurturing and challenging Christian environment for Eirik? Then may God be with us. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the waters of Mary's womb, who was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, who became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, who washed the feet of the disciples and sent them forth to baptize all nations by water and the Spirit. Church, I invite you to raise your hands in a posture of blessing. Bless by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one baptized today, that he may rise and rise and rise in Christ. Amen. Well, let's see, shall we interrupt the, the, the feeding? How, how bad will that go? <laughs> We'll give it a try. Eirik, let's see if you're ready for this. Come here, sweetie. There he is. Eirik, Howard, Kewell, Spencer, we baptize you in the name of the one whom Jesus called Abba, Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit be upon you, Eirik, child of God, disciple of Jesus, and member of the church. Amen. Amen. Will you join with me in the congregational welcome? We rejoice in God's empowering love, freely given to each and all. We welcome you, newly baptized, into the circle of love in Christ Church. We promise to pray for you, to seek the depths of faith with you, to support you, and to love you. We covenant with you to love God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves. Amen.
This morning's scripture lesson comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at the 38th verse. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. May we be blessed with understanding. Please be seated. And will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. After temptation in the wilderness and the calling of the first disciples, now a crowd is following him, and he's gone to a mountainside. And Jesus sits down and begins to teach them. And what he teaches that day will come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a beautiful passage of scripture with much richness and a lot to discover. Here, now, Jesus needs the disciples to understand what it means to truly follow him, to be his people in the world. He says, you will come across people that you'd rather not come into contact with, people you might consider your enemy, people very different from you who you'd rather not share the good news with and others who you wish the kingdom of God did not apply to. This is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus encourages the disciples to love their enemies. Loving our enemies may not sit well with most people. In fact, it may not sit well with some of you. First, you have to determine just who are our enemies. 
Do we agree with who the media tells us are our enemies? Do we hold prejudices against certain groups of people who we think want to do us ill? Do we have to face the fact that there are people in our daily lives who make our blood boil? Or do we deny our own capacity to think of anyone at all as an enemy? Even thinking about who our enemy is, is a challenge. So if we're uncomfortable just thinking about who our enemy might be, how far we have come from Jesus' commandment to love our enemies. We might be tempted to interpret such a plea as dated, as something that belongs in Jesus' time and not ours, as one of those Bible verses that cannot stand the test of time because the distance between Jesus' world and our world is so very far. The problem with this section of the Sermon on the Mount is that it is too easily dismissed. We've heard it so many times before. We convince ourselves that Jesus' context did not have the complexities of our own lives until we remember that Jesus uttered these words amidst Roman-occupied Palestine, where the threat of crucifixion was a visible reminder on the horizon, where Jesus' family members and friends endured abuse, oppression, control, and domination. And we recognize that Jesus' world was no less complicated than our own. We realize that at the heart of Jesus' message in Matthew is this is a message that is essential for what it means to be church today. Loving your enemy? Really, Jesus? Do we have to? When the difficult days come, it's said humankind has two kinds of responses, fight or flight. If someone tries to hurt me or take my property or exploit their power over me, I only have two options as a response, to strike back or to run away. But Christ calls us to move in a third way, in a way that is surprising and brave and life-giving. Let's talk for a moment about the context of this passage. And to do that, we need to go back, way, way back, all the way to the book of Genesis, where in Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, we find Lamech, the great, great, great grandson of Cain, who says, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, surely Lamech is avenged seventy-sevenfold. So here's the story. Jim and Jack are working with their axes, chopping down trees. And Jack knocks out Jim's eye, bashes in his cheek. According to this rule of retribution, he would then have every right to kill Jack, to stone him to death. And then Jack's family has every right to go kill Jim and his whole family. And then their clan has every right to go kill the other clan. And back and forth, and back and forth, and this is the world as it was. But then Moses comes along with the Ten Commandments and a covenant with God. We've got to change some things around here. So now the rule is if someone knocks out your eye, you just take their eye in return. An eye for an eye. A life for a life. Even Stephen's retribution. This was progressive, liberal theology. A limitation on retribution. But then Jesus comes along and shakes things up again. Now, some people have interpreted this passage to be entirely pacifist, as if Jesus is saying, when things like this happen to you, when someone tries to harm you or take what's yours or exploit you, you should give in. You should back down. But that is not at all what this passage is saying. Jesus says, do not resist one who is evil. The Greek word here for resist is a technical term meaning to take up arms. In fact, Jesus is instructing the disciples not to take up their weapons 
However, we'll see, he does say, continue to stay in the fight. Don't retreat. Don't let the opponent dictate the terms of your encounter. Do not react violently to one who is evil, which sounds like fight or flight, but Jesus is actually calling us to a third way. You don't have to let the enemy determine how you are going to respond. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other as well. What does it mean to be slapped on the right cheek in this context? If we're equals and we're going to throw down, we will use our right hands to hit one another, right hand to left cheek. But notice that Jesus says, if you are struck on your right cheek. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, that means they have slapped you with a backhand slap a demeaning slap of inferiority. So to be struck on the left cheek, that's the cheek of equality. To be struck on the right cheek, that is the cheek of inferiority and oppression and power over. It's the cheek of putting someone in their place. It's a violent insult. And the options you have if you're struck on your right cheek are, one, to hit back, which probably won't go well for you, or two, to back down. But then we have Jesus' third way, where he says to respond by turning the other cheek. Now you have turned your left cheek to the person who is hitting you, and they are faced with a problem. Because if they continue to try to strike you on that right cheek, well, they can't hit you at all. They can't hit that cheek of exploitation anymore because you've turned it away from them. Now all that person can do is to try to strike you on the cheek of equality. They must admit your humanity and your levelness on this playing field. Rather than continuing to strike the right cheek, where they would internalize their superiority and your inferiority, and you would internalize that as well. When you turn the cheek of equality, they must either admit your humanity or walk away, or perhaps be reconciled with you. It's amazing. Amazing the intricacy of this one line, and it goes on for the next lines as well. If someone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak as well. Now remember, in that time, people only wore two garments. So if someone wants to sue the coat off of you, and you give them your cloak as well, well, you expose, well, you expose their greed, and you expose their self-centeredness, and you expose maybe a corrupt system. There is a long tradition of women from Africa in many different states resorting to naked protest in the face of official and usually male reluctance to listen to their grievances and address their demands, to expose injustice, to expose oppression, and to assert their blessedness as beloved children of God. Then the third line, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go a second mile also. According to Roman law, a soldier could force a civilian to carry his pack one mile, but only one mile. These packs were heavy, 60, 70, 80 pounds. If a person chose to carry the pack a second mile, this could be a means of exposing the corruption of the system. In fact, the officer's position would be jeopardized because he'd be seen to be breaking the law. So the tables are turned on the soldier, and if I choose to carry the pack a second mile, that second mile belongs to me. That second mile is God's mile. In that second mile, maybe we'd use the time to talk, talk about our families. You never know what might happen in that second mile. Perhaps we'd even find the humanity in one another. 
we'd initiate something that might transform something. In that second mile, could suffering be transformed into nonviolent, redemptive love? Jesus is trying to help poor people find a way to take initiative and take control away from their oppressors. The question is, how do we resist evil without becoming evil? How can you try to overthrow the domination system without using the, domi the dominator's method? Jesus' third way. It's not just a strategy. You have to experience a change in your own self, your own sense of worth and power. We have within us the power to affect real change, not only in ourselves, not only in how we respond, but all of us have the ability to hold up a mirror to bullies and hold up a mirror to the multitude of resistors like us and multiply this multitude. This is what the civil rights movement did and what current day justice movements are still doing. God has placed within us the strength to nonviolently resist, to show love when the world would have us show hate, and to stand tall and affirm our own humanity and the blessed humanity of all people. This is the starting point of the pursuit of justice. This is the starting point of peace. Amen. God be with you. May the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. Let us pray. O 
God. O God, O God, maker of all things, ruler of all earth's people, whose care is uncaged, whose love is abound. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Who are we to come into your company, God most high? Who are we? To invoke the presence of the creator of all things, who are we? To think that the source of all being and all good would deign to dwell among us. Yet you, O oh God, you put on human flesh and lived as one of us, taking on our human struggle, giving us the promise of life in you. And so we give you thanks for claiming us in the waters of your love and for nourishing us through the feast of your word and for the gift of the breath of life which moves throughout our being. O oh God, the world around us groans with disruption and need. Everywhere we look, we see a world in need of you, and so we pray for our good earth and the wisdom and will to care for it, for our nation and commonwealth and city, that our values and priorities reflect the needs of the poor, the aged, the vulnerable, for the war-torn corners of the globe, that your peace would flow like rushing rivers, we pray for those who rise up for freedom and fairness and those who lay low in fear and powerlessness. For the sick and the dying, for the waiting and the watching, we pray for relief. We pray for our enemies, the one across the sea and the ones around the corner, and in doing so, we pray for ourselves. Free us, O oh God, from a measured love which keeps a record of wrongs and failures, and free us to lean into your third way. Holy God, we call to mind our own beloved ones, some of whose needs we know, all of whose needs are known to you. We pray for Rodney, Alex, and Joe. We pray for Tom, David, Penny and Alice. We pray for Russ, Barbara, David, and Ron. And we pray for Janet, Lowell, and Mary. And on this day, we give thanks for your love made known to us in the love of one another and celebrate the engagement of Dan and Audrey. And oh God, we are bold to pray even for ourselves, for the things we need and the people we love and the thanks that we owe. We still ourselves now for you, O oh God, as we come before you in silence. We pray all of this, holding fast to the hope found with you, our sovereign God, made known in Jesus Christ, who is the first and the last and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
On the occasion of a child's baptism, it is customary to give a gift. A child's Bible, a cross, a blanket. And if you are worried, if you are embarrassed that you didn't bring a gift for Eirik this day, well, I have luck for you. Because here are the top gifts to give a newly baptized baby in the year 2020, according to God. A sturdy house of God filled with music and beauty and warmth. A Sunday school program in which all children know that they are beloved in God's sight. A just and merciful society where the poor is not forgotten. A public witness for the care and creation of our earth. These are some of the gifts appropriate and fitting for the child baptized into our care. Gifts not just found on Newberry Street or in the Prue, but gifts found in your heart. The offering will now be received.
Bless our gifts, O God. Bless and supercharge them. Turn our dollar bills into food and our checks into shelter and our coins into clothing. Turn loneliness into companionship, pride into humility, privilege into generosity, and fear into understanding. Bless our gifts, O God. Bless and supercharge them for your work in the world. Amen. And now let us go forth in peace, affirmed in our own dignity and blessedness and seeking out the blessedness in every person in through all the world. And let the whole church say, Amen. Amen.